Can you hear me? Okay, I got an nod from Carl. I'm good. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for our freedom to come here and worship you today. We thank you for the smile and the laughter of children. We thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, that we can experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. That we can feel the power of your spirit. Lord, help us not to fear the things of this world, but to only fear you, Lord. And perfect love casts out all fear of judgment. And we thank you and praise you for that. Lord, fill us with your spirit today. Teach us and guide us. Help us not just to be hearers of your word, but to be doers also. We just thank you and praise you for the freedoms that we have and the privilege that we have to tell others about you. Lord, may we live a life that brings you glory and honor in all that we do, empowered by your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week I talked a little bit about the great commandment. And it's pretty clear what the great commandment is because Jesus says it. I mean, plain and simple. He's asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he tells them. Well, this week we're going to talk about the great commission. And that's not as clear. And a lot of Christians today don't even recognize it, let alone practice it. So what is a great commission? Does it apply to me? Okay, so say that to yourself. Does it apply to Alan? You put your name in there. Does it apply to? Okay, does it? Or does it only apply to the disciples? A lot of Christians think it only applies to the disciples. Or those that are called to go out to foreign mission fields or whatever it is. But I'm going to tell you plainly, and you know I don't tell you things that might be you believe this way or that way as far as like pre-trib or post-trib and so forth. But I will tell you clearly that it does apply to you. Period. You have a precious, precious gift. The most precious gift that we could ever imagine. Salvation through Jesus Christ. Peace with God. Reconciliation. Paul says that we have an obligation to teach and preach that that we are God's ambassadors, as though God was making His plea through us. What a privilege and a right we have. What a responsibility that we have. And it's something that we cannot say that others will do for us. A couple years ago, I preached on the Great Commission, and I didn't even realize I did. But when I was saving my sermon, it said, this is already in your files. Do you want to override this or whatever, you replace it, whatever it says? And I was like, well, let me see what that one is. And I looked back at one of the things that I had in that sermon there. And there was a question with a survey from the Barna Group. And it was done back in, I think, 2017. And it was asked, have you heard the Great Commission? And it was asked to churchgoers. I like that word, churchgoers. It wasn't asked to Christians or believers or disciples. It was asked to, uh, of people that go to church. Well, first of all, you are the church. You come to this building to worship and to get equipped so that you can go out there and tell others about Jesus Christ. This is only a building, okay? This is the body of Christ. But here's the answers that they, that they got. 6% said, I'm not sure. 17% answered, yes, and I know what it means. 25% answered, yes, but I can't recall the exact meaning. 51% of churchgoers said they did not know what the Great Commission was. 
over half. Here's another thing that the Barna group put out in that same survey. They even kind of spoon fed them. Is this the Great Commission? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. 37% that said they knew what the Great Commission was said that that was the Great Commission. One of the other um, choices was love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself, from Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Sixteen percent said the Great Commandment and the Great Commission were the same thing. <clears throat> I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. Eight percent said that was the Great Commission. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow after me, Mark 8, 34. Five percent said that was the Great Commission. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God. 2% said that was the Great Commission. Mark 12, 7, 12, 17. And 33% of them, when the choices were there in front of them, said we're not really sure if any of these are the Great Commission. Now that was the answers to those who said, I know what the Great Commission is. And yet when you ask them what the Great Commission is, they still couldn't tell you what the Great Commission is. It's not found in your Bibles, this is the Great Commission, but it's found all throughout the Bible. And Jesus referred to those who decided to come and follow after Him as disciples. So I asked you again, does the Great Commission apply to you? And I have to ask you at the same time then, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Because if you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ, and I challenge you to go read your Bible thoroughly then you better go figure out whether you're going to follow Jesus or not. Because He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. If you're not following Jesus, then you might be one of those that are weeping and gnashing their teeth that day. Even if you've done mighty miracles in the name of Jesus Christ, if you are not following Him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength, then you're not probably following Him. And in that, remember from last week, is that loving your neighbor thing. As much as you love yourself and as Jesus loved. So this week we're going to talk a little bit more about the, the Great Commission. And it does apply to each and every one of you. I told you just a minute ago that Jesus called His followers disciples. He also called them friends. He also called them brothers. But he called them disciples first. That word in Greek is mathetes. It means pupil, student, or learner. So what are you learning? What are you equipping yourself to do? Why do kids get an education? Why do they further their education at college or whatever? To go into a career. To do what they have been taught to do. To put it into practice. No one goes through however many years of medical school to then sit back and say, well, I got it all figured out, but I'm not going to help anyone. That's just dumb. Can I say that from up here? It's dumb. You do all of those things that you learn and study hard so that you can apply that to how you live your life. And yeah, you might do it for compensation, and let me tell you something. The compensation that you can get from in heaven by building treasures there is far greater than what you'll ever get here working for that almighty dollar here today. So I guess the better question, rather than do you understand the Great Commission, because you will understand it if you answer this question correctly, is are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Pull out your Bibles. We're going to look at a lot of Scripture today. I'm not going to preach much. I'm just going to go over Scriptures. Matthew 28, let's go there because that's where we're going to find the Great Commission. Although it doesn't say this is the Great Commission. Here's what it does say in Matthew 28, starting in verse 16. Meanwhile, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain Jesus had designated. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him. But if you notice next... Some doubted. Then Jesus came and said to them, This is to the ones that believed and worshipped, and this is to the ones that still doubted. 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Why would Jesus tell you that first? He is the Lamb, as we read in Revelation, that is worthy to open the scrolls. He will return. Everything that He says can be trusted. And He says that He is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Chosen One, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the way, the truth, and the life. All of these things are you going to follow and learn from Jesus so that you can live like Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Him. Verse 19, Therefore, because that is the fact, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You don't have to fear. No matter what, I am going to be with you. Now, we're going to learn more about that. We can't even do this Great Commission on our own. We have to be empowered by the Spirit of God, which each and every believer has. And Jesus will never, ever forsake them. He will be with them. God will not let one hair on your head be harmed without it being in His will. All you need to do is do this Great Commission. Okay? We'll go into it further details probably next Sunday, so you know what I'm going to teach about because there's a lot of information here. But today I want you to see that whether you're a disciple or not and whether you should be partaking in the Great Commission or not. So now we're going to go to the end of Mark. I'll give you a second to turn there. Mark chapter 16 is the last chapter. There is some controversy over Mark and its ending if you don't know that. Some of your Bibles may say that. In your Bible, you may have verses 9 forward, I think 9 through 25, if I have that right. No, 9 through 31, excuse me. Some of your Bibles may stop at verse 8, though. The reason for that is there's not enough early textual information that we have, documents that we have that show the other verses. Some people think that the church added those later verses on because the end of Mark is kind of cut off. But we're going to look at it both ways, whether those verses should be there or shouldn't be there. They're in our Bible, first of all. And let me tell you that if they're in your Bible, that is what God intended and planned. So you have no problem reading them. But if you see a little footnote that says some of the texts don't have these, that's okay too, because we're going to look at it with and without these verses. But you'll find the Great Commission in these verses that were added. Okay? Or that were there in the beginning and we lost them from the manuscript. Whatever it might be. So starting in verse 9. Early on the first day of the week after Jesus had risen, He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom He had driven out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with Him, who were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that Jesus was alive and she had seen Him, they did not believe it. After this, Jesus appeared in a different fo form to two of them and was... And as they walked along in the country. And they went back and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. You can find corresponding passages for these in John 20 and then Luke 24. Later, and this is the passage that compares in Matthew that we just read. As they were eating, Jesus appeared to the eleven and rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had, those who had seen Him after He had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not harm them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will be made well." Now, again, we're going to go into more of that next Sunday because you've seen a lot of things there that you don't even think probably belong in the church. Because <laughs> when you see handling snakes, I know I do, it kind of bothers me. But there should be miracles that the body of Christ is doing because the Spirit of God is indwelling and empowering them. So don't forget that part of the Great Commission. You are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You are His disciple, fully equipped to carry out the Great Commission in powers and wonders. 
Jesus said, greater things you will do. So do not stifle the Holy Spirit. I'm going to keep reading in Mark to the end. Verse 19, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. They started doing what Jesus told them to do. And the Lord worked through them, confirming his word by the signs that accompanied it. Now we're going to read on in a little bit. There was a time period here of 40 days when they were taught more that they didn't go out until the Holy Spirit equipped them. Because guess what? You can't do it without God's power. Just like you can't save yourself, it is God who saves you. It is God who created you, that gave you life. It is God who gives you new life through Jesus Christ. It is God who empowers you to live a life like Jesus Christ. The word Christian, if you are in fact a Christian. Verse 21. Again, Jesus... Oh, excuse me, that's John now. There was only 20 verses in Mark. Okay, sorry, I didn't see John there a minute ago. Turn to John. <laughs> see, I can make mistakes too. John chapter 20, the last chapter, next to the last chapter, or last chapter in John, I don't remember. John 20 is where you're going to find about the Great Commission. Or is the Great Commission there? Let's look and see. Starting in verse 21. And again Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. Now notice this. And you're going to see this coming up again. But you're supposed to have peace. How many people in 2020 and going on into 2021 have peace in this world? The church should. You and I should. And that should be obvious as we go and tell the world. As we do our good deeds that glorify our Father in heaven. One of the things that people are going to see about us besides our loving deeds of kindness, what we profess, is they're going to see a peace that we have that they don't understand. And they're going to want to experience that. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am also sending you. Bam, there you go. There's your great commission. That's not just spelled out. This is the great commission. But Jesus is sending them, and He is sending them in peace into a troubled world. And if you think this world is troubled now, look back to the early church. We're not facing anything like they faced in persecution. And as we read through the New Testament last year, and don't forget your reading uh, plan up here this year, which is just you marking it as you go along, so you've got to be accountable. We saw that the letters that the disciples wrote and the followers of Jesus wrote continued to say, stand firm in your faith. If you're suffering, count it as a privilege because Christ Himself suffered. Don't fall down, but stand firm and hold each other up. Stand firm to the end so that you overcome. Verse 22, When he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails have been and put my hands into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were once again inside with the doors locked and Thomas was with them. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Because until you believe, until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, you cannot be Jesus' witness. If you're not Jesus' witness, then what are you? You're the opposite of what a witness is, one that testifies to the truth. In fact, that means that you would be denying the truth then of what you say that you believe. Because you're not confirming it, you're not a witness. So stop doubting and believe and have peace in this world and experience the power of the Holy Spirit living in and through you. Thomas replied, My Lord and my God, verse 29, Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. 
But blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. Now that's just so significant because we don't have to see and physically touch. We can look at creation. We can look at changed lives of those who do profess and do live like Jesus in this world and see that God is real and that He is powerfully working in His children if you are, in fact, His child. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of His disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Promised One, the One who will save His people from, his sin, from their sins. He is the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Now that kind of brings me up to our jars, so I'm going to go ahead and go there instead of later, and I might go back to them. Don't forget these, this beautiful artwork on here that my wife and I did, to remind you of the great command. But our neighbor's not even on here because you're going to have to put stuff in the jar to help you do that, to apply what Jesus has told you to live your life. It says, love the Lord, and we've got with all your heart, all your mind, all your body, all your soul or strength or spirit, whatever you want to put there. It's okay. Don't condemn me on which words I put. And you've got this beautiful artwork. A heart's pretty obvious. The ant body or turtle body, whatever you want to say. I've heard different people. That, that's your body, okay? You can tell it's a person, I think. Okay. And all your mind, hey. <laughs> you got this little head that you can tell it's a head because it's got a mouth and an eye. With that brain. Because you've got to change the way that you think. You've got to repent and realize that you're a new creation in Christ. That you were created and designed for a purpose. And any creation should work the way the Creator designed it to work. Otherwise, it's not being used for what it was created to do. And you're to love God with all your soul and be that bright light. <coughs> as the Spirit comes in and intertwines with your spirit so that you can worship God in spirit and in truth. So be sure you get your cards. Every family should have a card, a set of cards. Every person should have a jar. In this jar, Sherry and I read one of the first cards. And it was from John 10.10. 10. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And we've done this together and separately. And her jar is fuller than mine. I'll have to go admit she's been more faithful at it than I have. Even with the distractions, if you didn't notice, there's a full nursery back there. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. But we put our responses back in the jar. And there should be as many as you put in there. Mine doesn't have six or seven yet but it's getting there, about what our response is to that. Jesus said that He had come to give you life and to give you abundant life. Now, if you still live the way the world lives, chasing after things, even your family, your, your freedoms, whatever it is, are you really living the life that Jesus came for you to live? He came to set the captives free. He came so that sin would have no dominion in your life. He came to give you the same power that He had, that He lived while He was here on this earth. Resurrecting power. Are you living like that? So my answer is back. I can't answer for Sherry, but my answer is back. Were how I wanted and how I needed Him to do it for me, because I can't do it on my own, to live that life. And some specific ways that He would have me to live that life in the Great Commandment, the Great Commission, and so forth. Okay? So that was our challenge. If you didn't get any, there's plenty of jars up here with this beautiful artwork. They're all unique, hand-painted. A work of art. <laughs> there are cards up here. There are calendar readings. And every family should have a magnetic calendar. And I have to say this, and I'm... I know I'm getting taped, so I have to watch what I say. But we were given these. Did we do it virtually? Okay, we did it virtually, so we weren't given these. We were shown about these, and there's a book that I've got. That we're going to start a Sunday school class, too. You're supposed to put this on your refrigerator and then put your neighbors in your proximity, okay, so that you know who your neighbors are. And then you're supposed to work out the great commandment, to love your neighbor. So every family should have one of these. 
Here's what I was talking about about being taped, though. I was the only pastor that asked to have some of those magnets to give to you. I can't believe... It doesn't matter how many. I can't believe that no one asked. We got one. It came in the mail. But when I got it in the mail, I'm like, why did I get one? If I'm going to share this, if I'm going to shepherd, that's what a pastor means, shepherd the flock, then where are their magnets? And we got some, and if I need to get more, I'll ask for more. But I'm sad to say that no one else asked for magnets. I'm going to take this seriously. I don't know if you are or not, and I'm going to tell you one reason that it hit me so hard. Because when I read God's Word, it does speak to me, and we need to continue to read God's Word every single day. It's just as important as the physical food we eat. I think someone said that somewhere in here. I think. You can look for yourself. But I was asked a question during that meeting or in that book, I don't remember what it was, and said, if you were gone from your neighborhood, and if your church was gone from your neighborhood, and I am literally living this, would your neighbors miss you? Or would they even know that you're gone? Well, most of you know we're trying to get our house sold where we're at. I've not had one neighbor come to me, and of course I haven't gone to one neighbor. I'm not going to be missed. Now, what does that say about my impact on my neighborhood? doesn't have much to say positive, does it? So this is why we have this challenge out here, so that we can take seriously the greatest commandment. All of the law and the prophets hinge upon this and teach about this. Every word teaches that God is trying to reconcile Himself to mankind, and now He's using you and I if He's using you and I. And the Great Commission tells us to get out of our comfort and go and do these things with the power that comes from on high. So yes, it applies to you, and are you doing it? Turn to Luke chapter 24. We'll see what Luke says about the Great Commission. And I'm in verse 36. While they were describing these events, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. But they were startled and frightened, thinking they had seen a spirit. Why are you troubled? Jesus asked. And that makes me think of John chapter 14 when Jesus said, Don't let your hearts be troubled. You know where I'm going, and I'll come back for you. So in the meantime, be telling everyone of that hope. Don't be troubled. Don't be fearful. Be joyful. Experience peace and go and tell the world with the power that comes from on high, the Holy Spirit which lives inside of you. Jesus asked, And why do doubts arise in your heart? Verse 39, Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. While they were still in disbelief, so don't beat yourself up for that either. This is the twelve that walked with Jesus and seen the mighty miracles that He did. Because of their joy and amazement, He asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? So they gave Him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. Jesus said to them, These are the words I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me and in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead and on, the, on the third day. And, his name, and in his name, repentance and forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed. That means you and I have got to proclaim it. Not just a set few, but everyone who decides to be a disciple or a follower of Jesus Christ. It will be proclaimed to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So let's go back and let's examine what that word means again. We looked at what disciple meant. Mathetes means pupil or student or learner. So what does this witness word mean? In Greek, it is the word martus. That sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Mar martyr. Do you know that's where we get that word from? Because they died for what they believed. 
If you chose to deny yourself, you chose to take up an instrument of pain and suffering that might just crucify and kill you. But unless you do, you cannot follow after Jesus. Because the things of this world still are your God. They still have a hold on you. And you're not living by the power of the Spirit. You still are living in fear. You're not living in the peace that Jesus died to give you. And you're not being a proper witness to the world because you have conflicted gods in your life. Verse 49, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but remain in the city until you have been clothed with power on high, because you cannot do this job on your own. When Jesus had led them out as far as Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, praising God continually in the temple. Now, turn to Acts while we're here. You know from your reading that Luke wrote two different books, the Gospel of Luke and the continuation of the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of the Holy Spirit in the church. That's what I like to call it. We see the church. We see the growth of the church, the power of the Holy Spirit that comes on high, and we see that their numbers are added to them daily, even though they were persecuting and suffering, because the power of God lived in them. The peace of God lived in them, and they lived out the Great Commission. In Acts chapter 1, in my first book, O Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them with many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a span of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And while they were gathered together, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift the Father has promised, which you have heard me discuss. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Great Commission's power that lives inside of you, if in fact you let him live. Verse 6, So when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Jesus replied, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. That authority to know all the answers to everything, and I know we get in the habit of trying to figure it all out, that's God's authority. You, by Jesus' authority, were called to be His witness. Not to debate about religious things or get stuck there or just spend your time always getting training but never apply your training. You were given power to be Jesus' witnesses until He does return. But, there's that but, since you don't need to know all these things, the exact opposite is you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and here's a great commission. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, they, the sky, they watched him as he was taken up, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking in the sky? <laughs> Didn't you hear what Jesus had to say? You need to go and prepare for this great commission that Jesus is giving you. And when you receive that power, and you receive that power when you said that you believed in Jesus Christ, then go and tell the world about your faith, your peace, the grace that has been given to you, that you once were an enemy of God, but now, not only are you his friend, but you're his child. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go up into heaven. Go with authority from Jesus and tell the world about him. You're reading for this week if you want to follow along with me. 1 John chapter 1, 2, 3, Four, five, sorry. And then 
Matthew, or am I right? Let me think. No, I'm not. John, excuse me. Let me find it here. The Gospel of John, chapter 14. So 1 John, all five chapters, and then John, chapter 14. Now, you can read any way you want. You don't have to follow me, but if you read them, then you mark it off. But I'm going to be talking more about this next week in tying this great commission and the great commandment together. Because John, the one that wanted to call down fire from heaven, will tell you more about love and action than any other disciple will tell you. 1 John, the whole book, five chapters, and then the Gospel of John, chapter 14. So you've got six days worth of reading. Start Monday, read to Saturday. Because John will tell you how to live this life of love. And he will also tell you if you don't live a life of love, that you're not really a Christian. You'll get to see application of this new commandment, which is not a new commandment. It's a commandment of old, but even Jesus said, I am giving you a new commandment. Because what he did is he raised the bar. If you remember from Jesus when he was preaching his, his Sermon on the Mount, everybody was amazed. They weren't new teachings, but Jesus said, if you have heard it said, you've been taught this, but I tell you, if, you have com if you've looked at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. The truth was still there, but Jesus expounded upon it. It's not just marking off what's right or wrong. It's living a life of love. A life where you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And loving your neighbor as yourself. A life living that your good deeds, because you're doing them, will be the light that you shine to this world and they'll see your heavenly Father because of it. You'll get a little more understanding about Revelation also in the letters that Jesus wrote to the churches where He commended them for the good things but said, here's the things that you need to change. Because this world, you will have troubles. But don't lose faith. As children of the Most High, you have already overcome. So live like one who has overcome. It is God's love that compels you to love others and compels you to carry out this great commission and not leave it up to someone else. You are Christ's ambassador. But what if the Great Commission was not really a Great Commission? What if you lived your lives as it was a great, uh, let's see, a great, oh, suggestion? I think many Christians live it that way. Because it's for someone else to do, or I'll get around to that, or I'm not equipped to do that. I think I've told you differently whether you believe it or not, and use Scripture to do it. We just read. I didn't really do anything but expound upon it. Or maybe you live it as the great omission that you don't even carry it as a part of your life. You totally leave it up to someone else. It's called the Great Commission for a reason. Yeah, you won't find those exact words, but Jesus was clear in the fact that He said, once you've received the power of the Holy Spirit, go. Live like me in this world. Perform mighty miracles. Draw others into the kingdom until I return and take you home. It's your job. It's your commission. It's your obligation, it's your duty, it's your privilege, however you want to look at it. It's Christ's love living in and through you. Because God loved you so much that He gave His one and only Son to save you. How could you ever keep that gift suppressed? It's something that was given to you to share with the entire world. But let's go back to Mark chapter 16. And this is the last place you've got to turn. What if we didn't have verses 9 through the end? Would the Great Commission still be there? 
Merle read the two last verses earlier, and now you'll see why we had those verses. What if the Great Commission wasn't there in Mark? What if the church just added that feel-good ending to it? Or what if it was lost, if that was the case, from our Scriptures and we didn't have it? It's still clear from everywhere else what Jesus teaches. But I want to show you what the ending would be like if we just read through verse 8. Mark 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so, that, so they could go and anoint the body of Jesus. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they went to the tomb. They were asking one another, Who will roll away the st stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, even though it was extremely large. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. Do not fear. Have peace instead, right? You are looking for Jesus of the Nazarene, who was crucified. But he's not here. He has risen. See the place where they put him. Verse 7 and 8, which Merle read this morning. But go tell his disciples and Peter. The Great Commission started with women. Come on, women. Yay! <laughs> amen. See there? Do I have another amen? Okay. Just as the angel came to the shepherds, lowly shepherds that night, and told them the good news that was for all men. It started with women, but let's read on here. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So the women left the tomb and ran away, trembling and bewildered. And in their fear, they did not say a word to anyone. Well, you know what? That's where Mark would end if we didn't have those other verses. But we know that's not the ending. Because the ladies did go tell. Yeah, they were scared to go do it. They figured the men would mock them and ridicule them. No one raises from the dead except Jesus and all those who put their faith and trust in Him. They were fearful. You and I are fearful. We don't think we're equipped. We don't think we'll have the words to say. We don't think we'll have the monetary means that, that we need to support this ministry. Whatever it is, those are fears from the world, from the deceiver, the one who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give you abundant life, as my card from John 10, 10 said, that I could have life to the fullest, that I could go and tell and not be worried about what would happen to me or where my supplies would come from or anything else. I don't need to know about all those things. What I do need to know is I, that I have been given power from on high and that I will be Jesus' witness even if it causes me to be martyred because it's well worth it. It's the greatest gift ever given and you have to share it. That's why they call it the Great Commission. The women did not go. They overcame their fears. They told the disciples who told Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the utter, utter ends of the earth. And we see a church that pro not only grew but prospered even while it was being tormented to the point of being burned alive as a lamppost or fed to lions as sport. But people didn't lose their faith. They had peace and comfort and hope that no one could take away. Perfect love casts out all fear of what can happen to you. Perfect love is shown when you love the Lord your God with everything and you love your neighbor as Christ loved you. Are you living King Jesus' command? For you. The twelve took Jesus' commands in the Great Commission very seriously, even to death. Here's what happened to them Andrew was crucified, Bartholomew was beaten and crucified, James, the son of Alphaeus, was stoned to death, James, the son of Zebedee, was beheaded, John was exiled for his faith, and he died of old age. 
so he could continue to write us the revelation that came to him and everything. But he was exiled. Judas, not Iscariot, Judas the other, was stoned to death. Matthew speared to death. Peter crucified upside down. Philip was crucified. Simon was crucified. Thomas was speared to death. Matthias was stoned to death. Let's go on to some of the others. Paul was imprisoned and then beheaded. James, the brother of Jesus, was stoned, or there's a couple different traditions, was beaten and thrown out of the top of the temple. John Mark had a rope tied around his neck and was drugged through town by a horse until dead. Luke, there's different varying traditions, but all say that he was martyred. Jude, the brother of Jesus, unknown, but most uh, traditions say that he was crucified, and then to finish him off, he was shot with arrows while he was being crucified. They were martyred because they were Christ's witnesses. They took their faith seriously. Do you take your faith seriously? Do you take the great, greatest commandment seriously? Do you take the great commission seriously? Don't forget these things, and I want to share with you one more thing. This is my jar, though, okay? I said ironically last week, this was the mail from last week that John gave me. There was a little flyer here that said to neighbor, which is kind of what we're doing. And it just says neighbor, didn't know my name or anything. And then it talks all about the peace and everything that comes and gives Bible verses and a little track. Well, that's just nice. It's real nice. But it doesn't mean anything to me. Because you haven't been my neighbor. I don't know who this person is. I'm not condemning. But there's a total difference when you live out what Jesus tells you. Yeah, this is a nice little attempt. But when you come over and talk to me and you pray with me and you know the things that are and you help provide for me, then what happens, Merle? They ask you about the faith that you have, right? We've gone over this time and time again. You just send a letter out that says neighbor and it's probably going to get filed in that circular file. That's nice. Here is an example from the Free Methodist. Nothing for me. What, what does that mean? Since the coronavirus has hit our world, many people are struggling. Many people have lost their jobs. Many cannot provide for their daily needs. As church leaders, we decided to help people from various house churches by distributing food, rice, pasta, sugar, and tea. We wanted to bless them and show the practical love of Christ. When we visit their homes, we pray with them and encourage them. We do this at least once a week for each family. After praying with a family at our last stop for the day, their neighbor spoke to us and said, Nothing for me? Every week you come here with your friends, but you never bring anything to me. We did not know her or anyone from her family, but we sent someone from our team to a nearby shop to purchase food for her. I wonder if they worried about whether they had the funds, because I'm sure they were already allocated for those certain people and everything, right? Just I'm throwing that in there. She was pleased to receive the food when we presented it to her. I asked her if I could pray for her and her family inside her house. She said, no, I don't believe what you believe. We responded, that's okay, and continued to bring her food every time we visited her from that point on. One day when we brought food, she asked us to come in and pray with her. We prayed and also read God's Word. The scripture passage from Matthew 18 told her how the Son of Man had come to save that which was lost. The Holy Spirit helped her to understand she was one of the lost Jesus came to save. She was ready to accept Christ as her Savior. After inviting Jesus into her heart, her thoughts turned to her family. She asked, how can I help my family follow Christ? Follow Christ. They know nothing about Him. She had been hungry for more than just physical food, and she continues to be eager to learn more about her Lord. One of our female leaders is now discipling her and her family. There's something to this neighboring thing. Do you think Jesus literally meant it when He said everything in here tells you to love God and love your neighbor? Just as much as you love yourself. In fact, a new commandment I give you, to love as I have loved you. 
And you can't do that sitting here and not going. This is great, but going and loving on them and then being ready for when they ask you the hope and peace and joy that you have and why you would do these things, then you can tell them about Jesus, your Savior and your Lord. So don't forget to get these things. This isn't going to change your life, but this will help remind you and focus you. And I'm going to preach more about tying those two things together next week. Fair enough. And I got one other thing to show you in just a minute before I quit. But I'm going to close in prayer, and then I'm going to do something. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you, for you are an awesome God in complete control in times that we think that are utterly out of control. You have given us a mission field, and you've given us the obligation, and you've given us the power to be your witnesses. Lord, help us not to take such a great salvation so lightly. But in fear and trembling, work out our salvation so that we hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for not only the words in the Bible, but the fact that the, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and died for us, showing us and empowering us the way. We thank you for Jesus Christ, his finished work on the cross and the work that he still has to do through us until he returns. We thank you and praise you in his precious name. Amen. Now.